We've just listened to one of the famous marriages, the wedding feast at Cana. It's famous because Jesus and his mother attended it. Now, a marriage in the Far East was always a time of great rejoicing. Sometimes marriages lasted for seven days. But in the case of the poorer people, for only two. Whatever the case, at Cana, at some point during the celebration, the wine suddenly ran out. This was very embarrassing because of the devotion that Mideastern people have to being hospitable, and also because of the mortification it would bring to the newlyweds. It's interesting to note in this story from John's Gospel that it was not the servant who notices that the wine has run out, but the Blessed Mother. And she very quietly says to Jesus, her son, they have no wine. Hidden in her words was not only an intuitive awareness of the power of her son, but also a compassionate expression of her desire to remedy an awkward situation. At first, Jesus was curious as to why she would be making this request. Woman, what is that to me? My hour has not yet come. Whenever Jesus uses the word hour, it always relates to his passion or death. For example, the night that Judas came into the garden and kissed Jesus, our Lord said to him, this is your hour and the powers of darkness. A few hours later before at the Last Supper and anticipating his death, Jesus said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify your son with the glory that he had with you before the foundations of the world were laid. Even earlier, when a crowd attempted to take his life by stoning, scripture says, his hour was not yet come. So here now at this wedding, Jesus was saying to his mother, that the hour in which he was to reveal himself had not yet come according to his father's plan. And yet implicit in Mary's statement, they have no wine, was a request that he actually begin it. Mary's answer was one of complete acceptance of the father's plan. Her answer to Jesus, was what she had learned to do with her own life in response to God's will. Turning to the servants, she says, do whatever he tells you. The first lesson we can learn from this miracle at Cana comes from Jesus, comes from Jesus. In one sentence, it goes like this. Help yourself, and heaven will help you. Jesus could have produced wine out of nothing, as he made the world from nothing. But he commanded that the wine servants bring their pots and fill them with water. This helps me to realize that we must not expect God to transform us without our bringing something to be transformed. It's useless for us to pray, O oh Lord, help me to overcome my evil habits, or, or let me be pure. Help me to become sober. Help me to be honest. What good are these prayers unless we bring at least our own efforts? God will surely make us peaceful and happy again, but only on the condition that we bring the water of our own feeble efforts. In other words, we, we just can't sit back and be passive. 
waiting for God to show his power. There must be the gesture of our efforts and desire, even though may, they may be as mediocre as the routine waters of our ordinary lives. The bottom line, collaboration with God is essential if we are to become children of God. The second lesson of Cana comes from Mary. She makes me realize that she intercedes to gain for us what we need without our always knowing our needs. I mean, mothers, as we know, have this incredible intuitive instinct about their children. Mary, our mother, I believe, has a deep spiritual intuition. She sees our hearts. And often we do not know what it is most vital to our lives. There are some of us who do not know the reason for our unhappiness, for our despair, for our loneliness, for our fear. We pray for wealth to break the bank so that we can win the lottery. We, lo we long for peace of mind as we seem to look for some counseling when we should be asking for peace of soul and going so far as to be humble enough to express sorrow for our sins and asking pardon. We are at the end of our strength and even of our hope and we either do not know that we ought to be asking or we can't seem to find the motivation to ask God for his grace and his love. And, and I think this is where Mary comes in. The people at the table at the wedding feast did not know what they needed to maintain the joy of the marriage feast, even when our Lord was sitting right there in their midst. There are many of us who would not come to our Lord unless we had someone who knows our needs better than we know ourselves and who will ask our Lord for us. And that is what Mary loves to do. That's what she loves to do. And that's what makes her so acceptable to everyone. One thing is certain. No one, absolutely no one, will ever call on her without being heard, nor without being finally led to her divine Son, Jesus Christ, for whose sake she exists for whose sake she was made pure, and for whose sake she was given to us.